Welcome back, folks, to Hashtag Ask GSM here today for August 29th, 2016. I'm Graham GSM Matthews with another jam-packed edition here today. A lot of great questions that I want to get to. I'm technically doing this for a second time. I just did this for the first time uh, using my new video camera. We're doing audio only here today simply because I just recorded the video using my new webcam. And it came out really grainy, the audio and video. I thought it was a microphone issue because last week when we did it with John here on the show, shout out to John for joining me for last week's episode. It came out great, talking all about SummerSlam, Raw, TakeOver, so on and so forth. Uh, the audio and video were off. So when I did it today, I only used the built-in mic in the camera. And it was even worse than last week. So I don't know if it's a computer issue, um, a hard drive issue, webcam issue, mic issue. I'm not exactly sure what it is. It really doesn't matter anyway, though, just because when I go back to school next week, um, I'll be doing, I'll be home to record next week's edition on Labor Day. I'm going back on Tuesday of next week, um, back to college. But uh, that being said, I'll only be, probably be doing audio only again, just because it's a lot easier, um, especially with the new webcam. It just takes forever to load. Like using the new HD webcam, it just takes forever to upload to YouTube. Last week's episode, I didn't upload until like five o'clock, six o'clock, whatever it was. It just took forever. So I'm hoping that um, using audio only, it's going to, it, you know, it's it's a lot easier just to upload, and it takes a lot quicker to edit and shit like that. So we'll probably just be doing that in the future, and we'll use the webcam for the random video blogs going forward only. So that being said, guys, welcome back to hashtag Ask you Sam once again. And um, if you want to send in questions, you can tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag, hashtag AskGSM, or you can find me on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Leave a comment on the question, or leave rather a question on the post that I usually put up on Sunday nights, or on the wall itself, or you can drop a question down below in the comment section. I'll be sure to include your comment in next week's edition. So with that being said, again, I've already answered these questions before. It's kind of like the lost episode of sorts. I might upload it at some point because it's pretty shitty, but anyway... I'm actually kind of glad I'm doing it again. I feel like the the first go around wasn't that great. So anyway, the first official question, uh, first official question from the first KFC. His question was: Were Mrs. Comments towards Daniel Bryan a work or a shoe? It really doesn't matter because I feel like, well, in my opinion, to answer your question, it was a work shoe. Um, just because if nothing in WWE is a hundred percent shoe, I mean everything gets approved with such you know, minuscule managing of pretty much everything that goes on nowadays on Raw, SmackDown, even these network shows that go on after SmackDown, after Raw, before Raw. Everything is so micromanaged that nothing ever gets by this company. It wasn't, a, you know, it's not like Miz barged on the set just to vent his frustrations, air his dirty laundry. It wasn't like that at all. Um, I do believe, however, there was a sense of realism to the promo. I am 100% sure that there was some built up frustration in Miz that he's you know been trying to get out for weeks, months, years, even who knows. Um so I'm, I'm definitely sure that what he was saying, he believed or at least part of it anyway. Um I don't know, it didn't feel like it was scripted, it did not come off as scripted. But then again, the second your your second question here, will he get heat if it was a shoe? Again, it wasn't a shoe. If anything it was a work shoe, a la Punk's pipe bomb from 5 years ago. You know, Punk has talked about it before on his DVD and other outlets that he was told to go out there and air his frustrations, you know, vent his frustrations on the company. Everything he said, he was just given, you know, he was given, you know, essential bullet points for, which is probably, a lot of things he talked about, he had bullet points, and I'm pretty sure Miz was the same way, albeit it wasn't like a two-minute promo, and like a ten-minute promo like Punk's, but still, I'm sure you know, he, he knew what he wanted to say, and just the way that it came across was all Miz, um, just the passionate fire he showed in his eyes during that promo last week on Talking Smack. Um, so again, I believe it was a work shoot. Will it get heat for it? Definitely not. Miz is the quintessential company guy. He does all the charities. He does all the media rounds. He does this and that. He appears everywhere at the Intercontinental Championship. Um, so he's not doing anything that he wasn't told to do. I'm sure he was told to go out there and, again, air his frustrations, vent his frustrations. The way he did it, he took it to an all-new level, and I thought it came out amazingly. Awesome, so to speak. Pun intended, I guess. Um, but he's definitely not getting heat for it. If anything, I hope they capitalize off it just because if they don't, it's a total waste. I know they did it just to get people talking, and they were successful at certainly doing just that. They were certainly successful doing just that, getting people talking, you know, driving people to the network to see the promo, to watch Talking Smack in the future, to what else could happen next. Um, but I really think that it might not have been designed to get over The Miz as a serious threat, but it might end up doing just that if they continue on to this little mini push or, you know, all the buzz that, it, that they can capitalize off of um, with Miz's recent comments on Talking Smack. His third question, card prediction for Clash of Champions. So obviously we'll find out more tonight on Raw. I'm recording this before Raw. 
and I, even as of this recording, I have no idea who's going to become the next Universal Champion, so I can't really say what that match will be. I know the original plan was to do Balor and Owens, um, so I hope Owens is still in that conversation come the next pay-per-view with either Rollins or Reigns, hopefully not Reigns. It makes sense to me to do the rematch between Reigns and Rusev that we did not get on Sunday, and it feels to me that would be the weirdest way to blow off that feud. I know Balor got hurt, they kind of switched up their plans, but to just completely scrap the Rusev Reigns feud makes no sense. Reigns beat him clean on Raw two weeks ago, he beat the shit out of him at SummerSlam, so why would he not get a title match? You know, it makes no sense. So they have to do that match at, Night of Champ at Clash of Champions. Um, I really hope it's not Reigns and Rollins, again, um, which I could very well see them doing, but, well, I guess we'll have to see. So I could see them doing Rusev Reigns, maybe Owen Zayn. I don't know if that's your main event. Um, Rollins Owens would be pretty cool. I don't know if you turn either one of those guys. That'd be pretty sick. Um, I would love to see something like that, personally. New Day Club, um, I know New Day's pretty much gone decisively over them a few times already, but I feel like they are building towards a title change at some point. So probably New Day Club, Charlotte Bailey, obviously, Titus O'Neil versus Darren Young. I really, I mean, not that I really hope not, just no one's going to care. Um, they could do the match, they need to fill three hours somehow, but just no one's going to give a shit. But those are a few matches I could see going down at the Clash of Champions pay-per-view, which is not until the final Sunday of September. It's not the penultimate show of uh, the, f the penultimate Sunday of the month like I thought it was originally. I guess not. It's going to be in the final Sunday slot of that month, I believe. Emmanuel A, also from YouTube. I'm not sure if I agree with you and John about Balor's NXT title reign being more memorable than Neville's. That feels like saying that Stone Cold winning the King of the Ring 1996 is what instantly propelled them to the top and that there were a few things being overlooked there. Now, this is all opinion-based, but having revisited some 2014 NXT episodes, Neville's champion had better performances, feuds, challengers, and character development than Finn. This may come off meaner than, it, than intended, but I legitimately can't think of one TakeOver special where Finn had match of the night. He always seemed to be outperformed or overshadowed during his title reign. I'd like to hear a counter-argument, but was Finn's NXT championship reign truly that memorable? Again, the key word there is memorable. I absolutely 110% agree that Neville had the better, nay, the best reign as NXT champion of anyone in that promotion. Um, but you and I are quote-unquote hardcore fans. We've been watching for years NXT. I got back into the product in the summer of 2013, and I've been watching religiously ever since. It's the best thing going, in my opinion, in WWE right now, other than the Cruiserweight Classic, obviously, but um, that's besides the point. Best regular program of Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. I think NXT takes the cake by a long shot. SmackDown's been getting better, but you know what I mean. Uh, so anyway, I know you and I were watching back at that point, but John didn't. I mean, he still doesn't watch NXT on the regular, so he doesn't even probably remember that Neville was NXT champion. I know he watched a few TakeOver specials in 2014, but Balor is the one that people most associate with the WWE's NXT championship. Like, an example to me would be, you know, obviously, who is the more memorable WWE champion? Miz, or not Miz, I'm thinking of the previous question. John Cena and Hulk Hogan, or Bruno San Martino and Bob Backlund? I think Cena and Hogan take the cake anyway in terms of better WWE champions, but most people don't even know who Bob Backlund is. I mean, not even Bob Backlund, he's on TV now, but Bruno San Martino, he doesn't get talked about a lot, he gets brought up sometimes. But most casual fans would not know who Bruno San Martino is, but they would know who Seth Rollins is. So did San Martino have a better reign than Seth Rollins? Yes. Did he have a more memorable reign than Seth Rollins? No, because most people, most people nowadays only remember Seth Rollins as WWE champion. You know what I mean? I feel like people associate that championship with Balor just because he held it for so long from the point that people started getting into NXT on the regular. It's only grown in popularity since last summer when Balor won the championship. So, yeah, I would stick with my comments that I made last week that Balor is the more memorable NXT champion. Neville was champion during the time that most people weren't really watching or even aware of NXT. So while Neville did have the better reign, he's, in my opinion, not more memorable. I mean, we watched 2014 NXT episodes. They're on the network, but most people didn't. So I definitely have to agree with my statement that I made last week that Balor is the more memorable NXT champion, but I would agree that uh, Neville is the better NXT champion, if not the best NXT champion this company ever had. Just based off, you know, the title defenses. Like you said, he had great title defenses, even on TV against Brodus Clay, Tedis O'Neill, Tyler Breeze, and so many others. Frank Ashier 15, also from YouTube, will the, will the Cruiserweight division be wasted once they arrive on Raw? I mean, I'm an optimistic person, so I'm going to say no. Um, I, I could see them being wasted. I'm not saying there's no chance of them not being wasted uh, or, or no chance of them being wasted. 
But uh, I, I want to be optimistic. I think they will treat this thing seriously. I do think it will be a prominent feature on Raw, or at least they hope so. Otherwise, what's the point? It's a three-hour show. They deserve some time. Um, kill some time with these guys putting on great matches. I'm all for it. But um, I don't think they will be wasted just because they're bringing them in with a purpose coming off this amazing Cruiserweight Classic show. I feel like it would take a lot for them to botch this you know, you know, this new returning Cruiserweight division. But I guess we'll see anything can happen. Uh, thoughts on a Brock Lesnar versus Shane McMahon match? I don't know. I feel like I talked about this last week because I feel like someone must have brought it up, but I guess not. I'm just not a fan. I'm not really a fan. Maybe 15 years ago. And I'm not saying that the match would be shit. Actually, it could be. I'm not exactly that sure um but going back to Shane's match at Wrestlemania 32 was it an instant classic absolutely not was it a spectacle yeah it wasn't a great wrestling match but it was entertaining in my opinion just based just based off all the spots they did him jumping off the cell him jumping off the cell that's mostly what the match will be remembered for and is remembered for um but still I really don't have a strong desire to see Shane in the ring Against someone like a Brock, because even even in storyline purposes, from a storyline standpoint, it makes no sense to put Shane in the ring with Brock, because you know he'd fucking kill him. Shane is not an in-ring regular. Neither is Undertaker, but Taker is the Undertaker. Shane McMahon is not a regular performer. He could not hang with Brock Lesnar for more than 30 seconds. If Orton got decimated in seven minutes, ima- imagine what would happen to Shane McMahon. You know what I mean? The same thing happened with Taker. That Shane pretty much... He got a lot more offense in than I feel like he should have, but from a storyline standpoint, the guy is no threat to Taker. He's certainly no threat to Brock Lesnar. So I just don't really see, from another standpoint, from another respect, what it would accomplish. Okay, Lesnar decimates Shane. What does that even mean? Lesnar's on Raw. Shane's on SmackDown. Shane's a GM. Lesnar's a part-timer. I don't want to see Lesnar's you know, minimal dates wasted on a GM of SmackDown. It makes no sense. I understand writing Lesnar off on, you know, from TV and having him attack the GM of SmackDown. I get that. But following through with it and doing a match, I just don't care because it accomplishes nothing. Other than seeing Shane McMahon get his ass kicked and the the beating that he would take, he's a stellar seller. It could be a fun little match, maybe for a house show or a network special even, but not a pay-per-view. I feel like it's such a wasted spot where you could put people like a Cesaro in there or even a, a Kevin Owens. I'd rather see KO get his ass kicked by Brock Lesnar than Shane McMahon. Just from a storyline standpoint, seeing Shane get decimated by Lesnar makes no sense because you know that KO or Cesaro or anyone basically on the roster right now is more of a threat to Brock Lesnar than Shane McMahon. Captain Sunshine, their question was... Is Ziggler versus Ambrose destined to be one of those mid-2000 pay-per-view matches? You watch a decade later and wonder, wait, wait, what? How did this happen? You know, like 2004 having Brock Lesnar versus Hardcore Holly is a WWE title match with the Royal Rumble, or even Eugene versus Triple H from that year's SummerSlam. Yeah, I think it will be. I hate to say it, but yet think back on SummerSlam now a mere eight days later, and people are still talking about the great match between Cena Styles. They're talking about the controversial finish, despite how bad the match was and how no one, you know, it was a pretty disappointing match. People are still talking about Orton Lesnar. They're talking about the ugly ass championship, the Universal Title, and Balor versus Rollins. No one is really talking about Ziggler and Ambrose. The match was just kind of there. It wasn't a bad match. It was just very forgettable. And it just, yeah, it is going to be one of those matches. I mean, I, I feel like. Even to defend Hardcore Holly versus Lesnar, that was a match that could have happened that didn't really matter just because it was the Royal Rumble. The title matches rarely sell the Royal Rumble. The Rumble match, the the Rumble pay-per-view is all about the Rumble match, not the WWE or world title matches. So it didn't matter whether Brock Lesnar faced Big Show, Kurt Angle, or even Hardcore Holly. That show was all about the Rumble match. Um, but SummerSlam is about the matches. There is no Rumble match at SummerSlam, so Lesnar and Ambrose should have been a draw for SmackDown, and I will grant them that the build was very good, but it was by no means a marquee draw for the pay-per-view, and also in retrospect, why did it happen? I said weeks ago that if Ziggler wins, or rather he loses, clean 1-2-3, it was a fucking waste. The guy lost, what do you do next? And he lost his styles on SmackDown, as he should have, but where do you go next with this guy? If he turns heel at some point in the near future, then I'm all for it, but if not, then what was the point? So I do agree that 10 years down the line, even by the end of this year, people will largely forget that Ambrose versus Ziggler at that pay-per-view even happened. Next question, next couple of questions come from Brandon A. from YouTube. Uh, first one being, since Michael Cole actually acknowledged Demolition's tag team title reign as the longest ever, 
Do you think the New Day will break the record now, especially considering that they are part of the WWE lawsuit? It's possible. Um, I know they retained the titles at SummerSlam, but I did not expect them to. I do expect, however, if there was a rematch between New Day and Club at Clash of Champions, that New Day's winning. Or rather, that Club's winning. I hope so. I love New Day, but it is time to take the titles off of them. I was more concerned w with them breaking the record of the WWE tag team title reign. I know there's two separate things, but people get confused. That New Day have... The lineage that their titles carry is the WWE tag team titles, which dates back to 2002 when they had that whole tournament for the SmackDown set of tag team championships. The World Tag Team Titles is the record that the demolition that demolition holds for for like 454 days, something like that. I know that's honky tonk, man, but around that time frame. And uh, that was for the World Tag Team Titles, which were retired in 2010, um, which were which were retired in 2010. So that being said, um, they could break the record if they want to. Um, I hope the company isn't that petty, but then again, it wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, they had Nikki Bella hold the Divas Championship for a whopping fucking 300 days just so they could have the record of AJ Lee broken. And literally days after she broke the record, she dropped the title. So it would not surprise me. I have no idea what the exact day has to be for New Day to break the reign of demolition. So they can become the longest, you know, the longest reigning tag team champions ever, just period in the company history, not only WWE, but world tag team championships as well. Um again, I hope not, just because I like demolition, but more so just because I really don't care to see New Day as tag team champions for that much longer. I still like New Day, but I'm ready for a change. I'm ready for Club to take the titles, or Enzo and Cass, or even Jericho. Basically anyone but New Day at this point. Um, so I mean again, it's possible, and they've done it before with Nikki Bella and AJ Lee, so uh, I would not put it past them for them, you know, to keep the championships on New Day for about, I think it's another three more months until they break the record. So until, I guess, Survivor Series, I would not put it past them for them to keep the belts on the New Day for them in order to break the reign of demolition because they're a part of the current lawsuit against the company for concussion awareness or some, sh you know, some stupid shit like that. And it's not like legit concussion awareness. It's about like... I don't want to go full in depth with it, but the whole lawsuit is about former employees that claim to have been uh, neglected by the company, you know, health-wise, but a lot of it is just pure bullshit. That's another story for another day. Who should induct these future Hall of Famers? The Rock, Kurt Angle, Triple H, Undertaker, and John Cena. The Rock has to be Stone Cold. That's an easy one. Uh, Kurt Angle, I feel, is not as obvious. Pff, maybe Shelton Benjamin. I don't really know. There's not really one person that was most associated with Kurt Angle. Uh, maybe Triple H. Those guys were always great rivals. I'd have to go... They, they would probably do John Cena just based off their on-air history and how Kurt Angle had John Cena's first ever match in the main roster and they feuded for like three-something years, you know, in 02, 03. Not so much in 04, but a lot in 05 over the WWE Championship. So um, they'd probably do that. Have John Cena and Duck Kurt Angle. Um, so yeah, I'd probably, but I would do Triple H though, just based off their history or the rock, I guess from uh, 2000, 2001, or even Jericho, I guess, but that's kind of a long shot. Triple H, who would I induct Triple H? Who would I have induct Triple H? Shawn Michaels. That's an easy one. Or Ric Flair, but probably Shawn. Undertaker, Kane. I would have done Paul Bear, but he's dead, obviously. So Kane and John Cena. Again, there's not one guy who would, I would associate most with John Cena, uh, maybe Vince, because company, you know, John Cena is the quintessential company guy, a lot like The Miz, and he's been around for over 15 years at this point, just about 15 years, um, so probably Mr. McMahon, I guess, he doesn't induct many people, but I could see him making an exception for John Cena. His next question, do you think we will see matches like the Three Stages of Hell or Iron Man match more now that we have brand exclusive pay-per-views? I guess it's likely, but my, you know, my grape has always been this. Bring those championships, or rather, bring those stipulation matches back only if they serve a purpose. I hate to have the whole fucking Hell in the Cell match every October or the TLC match every December. Hold the matches when they mean something. Don't just hold the matches because, oh, it's that time of the year again, you know? I feel like we have way too much of that nowadays. The Royal Rumble match is the only exception. With every other pay-per-view, you don't need to do a stipulation match every, every you know, at the same time every single fucking year. It makes no sense. So anyway, um, I can't. Rem I think the last three stages of Hell match that we had was it must have been Kane and Cena from Payback in 2013. I want to say Iron Man again. I think is better suited for every few years. I think it has nothing to do with brand exclusive pay per views. Uh, whether we had those or not, it would still be held 
just as rarely as they are now. Again, don't hold them once a year. Do them once every two or three years. The Iron Man match before it was brought back for Bailey and Banks to take over in October, last October. The last time it was held was October of 2009. That's a near six years difference. That's crazy. And it's a great match. So try to do it as, you know, as sparingly as possible. His next question is Eva Marie only hated because of the era she started wrestling in? Isn't it probably true that she could wrestle circles around people like Stacey Keebler and Tori Wilson, who fans absolutely adore? So I, get, I disagree with the statement that she could wrestle circles around those girls. I don't know if she's that much better, if better at all. Uh, Tori and Stacey were not offensive in the ring. They weren't great, but they weren't offensive in the ring like Eva is. And again, but you make a great point, though. I feel like Eva would not be as hated if she did come up five years ago. Or 10 years ago, you know, when we still had bra and panties matches and all that other kind of stupid shit, she would fit right in. But even more so than that, um, at least Tori Wilson and Stacey had charisma. Eva, she's gotten a lot better, but, um, you know, when she first started three years ago, she probably still would be just as hated. Not just as hated, but still hated to an extent five, ten years ago, just because her personality was wooden as hell. I will never forget when she made her debut in that Miz TV segment with the rest of the Total Divas, you know, cast right before the show debuted on E! She had the mic and she bombed. It was bad. It was one of the worst TV segments all year and she was fucking awful. So, I mean, you know, I know Stacey and Tori Wilson were not the greatest wrestlers, but they had great charisma. They can connect with the crowd even without showing their tits to, to the audience or whatever. They just look great. And Eva Marie looks great, don't get me wrong. But her personality at first, it's gotten better. It's still not perfect. But when she first started that, her mic skills, her presence was just absolutely atrocious. So, again, I don't know if she would be as hated, but she'd still be pretty hated just based off how bad she was when she first started out you know, three or so years ago. A lot of people want to see a Lesnar versus Nakamura match. I don't, considering that 90% of Lesnar's offense is suplexes and 90% of Nakamura's offense is knee strikes and stiff forearms. What are your thoughts on this? I still look forward to a match between the two. I know they had a match, fucking, what, 10, 11 years ago at this point, 2005 in Japan. Um, and again, I know that was over in Japan. That was before Brock Lesnar broke the streak and became the the monstrosity, the uh, unstoppable force that he is today, so it would obviously be a lot different. Um, but that being said, I feel like I, I still would love to see the match. I don't know how many people in today's you know today's current roster on today's current roster could beat the Beast. I don't even know if Nakamura could do it. But I think he's a lot more likely than Finn Balor, who's you know not as tall as Nakamura. Or I don't know. I just feel like Balor at this point in time is not a real threat to Brock Lesnar. No one really is. If Lesnar could dominate the likes of John Cena and Randy Orton in a matter of minutes on top tier pay per views then who the hell can be beat this guy? Maybe Roman Reigns. I don't want to see it. I know they have yet to do the rematch between the two, which I feel like is going to happen at some point. It's only inevitable. But um, beyond that, I don't know if Nakamura would be the one to beat the, the, to beat the Beast or beat Brock Lesnar. But I still feel like it's something new. It's something fresh. So I'm all for it. I don't know if the Clash of Styles, as you mentioned, would be as great as I'm painting it out to be. But I still like it would be a cool match just to see those two in the ring together, just, you know, based off purely presence after Nakamura's entrance and Lesnar's entrance. Take my money off that alone, you know? Uh, next question from Blue Eyed Assorted, my brother Jason. His question was, why did Shane and Daniel, uh, Daniel Bryan say on SmackDown with Heath Slater that No Mercy is a great name for their next pay-per-view, yet they changed it to Backlash on that SummerSlam promo? So, as far as I know, it's always been Backlash. That September Sunday pay-per-view for next month on Sunday, September 11th, has always been Backlash. Um, I know that pay-per-view lineup leaked several months ago, even before the actual draft, like in late June, whatever it was, that Backlash was coming back for that September pay-per-view. So it was never meant to be No Mercy. No Mercy is always meant to be, has always been that October pay-per-view. And I'm not talking about 10 years ago, that too. But um, as far back as the pay-per-view lineup leaked, that's always been No Mercy. That was always the plan, I believe. Um, but that segment did make no sense for a few different reasons. I think they said that, like, oh, when Shane said, oh, that'd be a great name for our pay-per-view. I don't know if he specifically said for our next pay-per-view. Um, I'd have to watch it back. Jason is adamant. We've talked about this before at work, but he was adamant that it was, uh, that they said their next pay-per-view. I didn't catch up on that. I didn't catch that. I just heard pay-per-view, period. I know they started selling tickets for No Mercy that week, so that's why they did it. 
Um, but it's not like Heath Slater came up with the name for the pay-per-view. No Mercy was a pay-per-view title 10 years ago. So they're basically recycling the same show they had 10 years ago. Unless they, you know, uh, you know, unless they forget about that and ignore that altogether, which I hope not because it was around for a long-ass time. But anyway, though, um, I don't think No Mercy was ever intended to be that backlash pay-per-view that we have now in September. I believe the plan was always to have it in October. Mr. Beetle 890 his question was, at the Raw exclusive Clash of Champions pay-per-view, what do you see the Universal title being? Or the t- Universal title match being, rather. Um, obviously, like I said, this is happening before Raw. I'm recording this before Raw. So, it could be basically anything. I know the original plan was to do Balor and Owens. Um, I hope Owens wins tonight. I'm not counting on it. I do think Reigns or Rollins is winning. And if so, I do see the match being Reigns versus Rollins. And again, it makes no sense just because we saw it a few months ago. Reigns is currently in the midst of a feud. With Rusev right now, excuse me. Um, so I'd rather just see Owens and Zayn, Owens and Balor. You, you turn Balor. We need a top babyface, and I hope it's not fucking Reigns. Um, with Balor being hurt, we need a new top babyface. And if they're demoting Roman Reigns, I sure as hell hope it's not him again. Um, I'd rather see it be Sami Zayn or somebody like that. But um, yeah, currently I do unfortunately see it being Reigns and Rollins, but I hope I'm wrong. His second question, do you think the Heath Slater and Rhino tag team has potential to be surprisingly entertaining? I said this on Twitter last week, but I do think so. I really like the idea of a Rhino Slater tag team. Slater is hotter now than he has ever been in his career, whether he was with 3MB, Social Outcast, The Core, Nexus, even the whole Legend storyline he did um, back in 2012 leading up to Raw 1000. I feel like he's more over now than he was four years ago. And he was really over leading up to that match with uh, Lita at Raw 1000, which was kind of disappointing in retrospect that it wasn't like Stone Cold or Edge or whatever. Anyway... Um, yeah, so I do think that tag team could be a lot of fun. I really hope this is not leading to Rhino turning on Slater. I mean, Slater should be a babyface before long just because people really want to get behind him. He's a great underdog. And just put him on SmackDown. He can be like the SmackDown version of Sami Zayn, but kind of in a different kind of way. And more, and more so that he's annoying. He's more like a Mikey Whipwreck of, uh, of 2016. But, uh, anyway, so yeah, I feel like the tag team can be very entertaining. Hopefully they don't cut it short. And they don't just team up on Tuesday only for Rhino to attack Heath Slater. You know, I really hope this ends up being uh, a a full-time tag team to give Rhino something to do and to give Slater some long-term direction as well. Mitch G, also from YouTube, has got a few questions here. First one being, would you say Gargano and Ciampa versus The Revival from Brooklyn 2 is better than American Alpha and Revival from The End? Very tough question. Obviously, I'm biased just because I was in attendance for Gargano and Ciampa versus The Revival from Brooklyn Takeover 2, from Takeover Brooklyn 2. Um, so I would say yes, but I have yet to watch it back, so I can't say for sure. I've seen American Alpha and Revival twice from the end. I watched it, obviously, a lot the first time around, and I watched it again, I think, the Saturday before Brooklyn, uh, before TakeOver 2, TakeOver Brooklyn 2 last week. So I watched it like a week in advance. Love that match. It was such a good match, and one of the best tag team matches I've ever seen. Um, so again, I, it, it's hard to compare the two because they're both so goddamn good. I'd really have to rewatch that Gargano Ciampa match versus the Revival. Um, which one did I enjoy more? Probably Gargano Ciampa versus the Revival, but it's hard to say which one was better just because I have to rewatch the first one before I can give you a definitive answer. So maybe ask me again next week if I've rewatched Takeover by then. Hopefully by that time I will. I haven't had enough time recently in order to do that, uh, unfortunately. His second question, rank these themes, Glorious Domination, Real American, Get Rid of the Fly, and Angel on My Shoulder. So I had no idea Angel on My Shoulder was the title of the Beautiful People theme song for TNA until I had to look it up. Um, So that's obviously last. Um, First one, it's hard to say, because I love Get Rid of the Fly, but Glorious Domination is just so great. Um, So maybe just because I'm in the mood right now, but Glorious Domination, number one, Get Ready to Fly, number two, Real American, number three, which is also really good, and Angel on My Shoulder at number four. Should James Storm have been the one to defeat Bobby Roode for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship? Yes, absolutely yes. And it's hard to say because Austin Aries versus Bobby Roode from Destination X in 2012 is one of my favorite TNA matches of all time. The moment of Aries winning and the emotion in Mike Tanay's voice when he said, yes, he did it, when Aries won the belt from Bobby, was so great. The match was really good. The build was great. The feud was awesome. Aries was on fire in the summer of 2012. So I hate to say, oh, don't capitalize on Aries' momentum right now by not putting the title on him. But, I don't know, I feel like the long-term story was there. They took the title off Aries anyway at Bound for Glory. They turned him heel right before Bound for Glory for that match with Jeff Hardy. So, I mean, 
really long term wise, I don't think it was worth it. I feel like the story was there with Storm and Rude, and Rude beat Storm for the belt right after Bound for Glory in 2011, so you have this great one-year story. And granted, they did end up doing Bobby Rude and Storm anyway at Bound for Glory in an awesome match, and probably my favorite TNA match of all time, um, but I feel like it would have been a lot better in the main event, no holds barred for the championship. Storm finally regains the gold, and he hasn't held the championship since, so I feel like they would have made, or really solidified Storm as a star had he re-won the championship, regained the gold from Bobby Bound for Glory. So I do say that um, as great as that Aries Rude match was, and as great as that moment was of Aries winning, he probably could have been given the championship down the line anyway. But I feel like the better choice would have been to put the belt on Storm, have him beat Rude for the belt at Bound for Glory by having him win the Bound for Glory series that September. His next question here, who do you see me? Who do you see being the eighth and final team in the SmackDown tournament, and who do you want it to be? I could easily see them putting Kane with someone like a Big Show. I hope not because he's on Raw, uh, or Kalista for one night. Not that I want that. I think it'd be awesome to see Luke Harper return and reunite with Eric Rowan, but I'm not sure if Harper's clear to return yet. I don't think he is either. I haven't heard anything. I mean, it's definitely possible they could be um, holding with you know withholding secrets from us and Harper is good to go and they're waiting until Tuesday to bring him back I don't think so the last I heard he won't be back until October at the earliest which really sucks because this guy is great um, but from what I heard over the weekend it might be the headbangers uh, I heard a report I saw a report they confirmed it themselves on their Facebook they were the ones that broke the rumor that broke the news WWE has yet to say anything about it that they're coming back to SmackDown on Tuesday. So I would imagine that they're the eighth and final team, the mystery team, in the SmackDown, in, in the SmackDown Tag Team Title Tournament, which is cool. I was never the biggest Headbangers fan, but they were definitely one of the better parts of 98 for me. And as you guys know, I'm not a huge 1998 fan, but they were definitely one of the better parts of that year for me. They are just really entertaining. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I'd love to see, like, London and Kendrick. I know that's not happening. Kendrick, or rather, London hates WWE, so that's not happening. But, um... Yeah, that'd be really cool. So, um, I, I I think it's gonna be the headbangers, and I have no complaints about that whatsoever. I don't think it's I think it's gonna be more so a one off. I don't think they've signed with the company. Maybe they have a Legends deal or something. That would be pretty cool. But from what I'm hearing, it's gonna be the headbangers. So unless they're swerving us, I'm looking forward to that. Um, his next question is: It a foregone conclusion that American Alpha will win the tag team championship tournament on SmackDown? I personally think it's a better story that a better story can be told with American Alpha chasing the winners. Whether it be a heel Usos, the Vaude Villains, Slater and Rhino, or the Mystery Tag Team. I agree. I feel like American Alpha, as great as it would be with them winning the belts and becoming the inaugural Tag Team Champions on SmackDown, I do think the better story is with them in chase mode for a while longer and build to that moment. I feel like the main roster audience isn't exactly itching to see them win the Tag Team titles right now. They just debuted. So I would give it a little bit longer, maybe a few more months, and before giving them the championships and No Mercy or TLC, Survivor Series, whatever. Or not TLC, but Roadblock. Whatever the fuck that pay-per-view is going to be. I don't know. So anyway, though. Um, yeah, I do think there a better story can be told with American Alpha in chase mode for a while longer, going after the SmackDown Tag Team titles. Elena, the why, uh, her question was this. And I did answer this. I did respond to her in the YouTube comments um, uh, you know, on the video from last week. But I do want to mention it because she makes a great freaking point. Uh, so their question was, ever heard of Chris... Krzyzewski, his question was, or rather, have you ever heard of Chris Krzyzewski, former TV writer who took over as WWF's head writer after Vince Russo left late in 1999? Ironically, he was made fun of for approaching wrestling like an actual TV show. He made relationship maps, he, he made relationships maps, relationship maps, rather, and character storyboards, the kind of thing TV writers would be doing uh, to keep, you know, to keep track of continuity. I don't know about you, but with, I personally wish that someone in WWE would bring that style back. I could not fucking agree more. I feel like WWE is definitely lacking in that department, that people don't realize this, that Raw, at the end of the day, it's sports, it's entertainment, but it's also a TV show. It's a television show, people. It's no different than The Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, Grey's Anatomy. It doesn't matter. They compute that shit in ratings, a lot like they do with you know football games and basketball games, all that other kind of thing. WWE has it twice as difficult, has has it twice as worse as you know than anyone else on TV, just because they're both sports and entertainment. That being said, Raw is, and they do treat it like they promote it as a TV show, or oh, the longest-running episodic television show in history. Okay, so you're calling yourself an episodic television show, yet your continuity is awful. Case in point, the New Day uh, segment, the New Day storyline from two years ago, right when they first started teaming, before the whole 
Chuck and Jive bullshit um, when they first came out as heels, and Xavier Woods was like the Malcolm X of the group. Remember that, like two years ago, uh, in the summer of 2014? They were building towards that for a few weeks before they dropped it all together. It was gone. And then they just took them off TV for like three months, and they came back as chucking and jiving baby faces. You know what I mean? It just made no sense before they finally wised up and turned them heel the following spring. But um, continuity-wise, it was awful. You know, you would never watch a show like The Walking Dead, and maybe they do do this. I don't know. But with most TV shows that I've seen anyway, they don't build up a character for six episodes before completely writing them off and then not even explaining it. I could see them, you know, having a character on their show, building them up before killing them off with an explanation. With The New Day, there was no explanation. There was zero explanation as to why they got written off TV when they did. No explanation, no nothing, not even an, an acknowledgement. That was it. Nothing. And that's just awful television. If you're watching as a regular viewer and you're not reading the dirt sheets to find out what happened at these live events and on, you know, talking smack and all this other stuff, you would have no idea what the fuck just happened. So, yeah, continuity-wise, they are in a lot of trouble. And I feel like hiring those kind of writers like Chris Kresge, as you said, Chris Kresge, uh, my apologies if I mispronounced that, but I feel like for the creative team, you need a healthy mix of TV writers, like people with experience with soap operas, and people that are passionate and knowledgeable about the product. And maybe that's the case right now, but they're just not motivated. I don't really know. I am not in that writer's room. But I will say that I absolutely agree that people should, I'm like, oh, they're bringing in these Emmy Award winning writers all the time. They know nothing about wrestling. Hopefully, they do have people on the team that do know something about wrestling, but people like that, that they that they hire that people criticize that fans criticize all the time they know a thing or two about wrestling being a soap opera which is it exactly is that it is exactly that it is a soap opera and they need more experience in that department mark s has a few questions here uh just one second first one being who do you think will win the fatal four-way match for the universal title on raw and do you think anything quirky or, or quirky will happen um, again, I would love to see KO win, but my money's on either Rollins or Reigns. Hopefully, it's not a non-finish of some sort. I'd rather see him just crown a champion tonight. They could just do a non-finish and build to the actual title match of the pay-per-view, but I really hope not. Just crown a new champion tonight. They already they already did that with SummerSlam. You know, wait until the pay-per-view to crown a new champion. We already saw that at SummerSlam. Why do it again? Just crown a new champion tonight. Clean one through three. Hopefully, it's KO, but it's probably going to be, um, it, it's probably going to be either Rollins or Reigns, like I said. Rollins is okay. Reigns, ugh, you know. Uh, so anyway, his second question. How would you resolve the Daniel Bryan Miz situation, or do you think it will be referenced again at all? Um, hopefully, I'm hoping that it wasn't just a one-and-done type deal. It probably was originally intended to be just that, just to get people talking and watching Talking Smack and checking out the YouTube channel and going to the WWE Network, and they were successful doing just that, but I'd be very disappointed if they don't capitalize this buzz at all. Um, just because so many people are talking about it, so many people are praising Miz for his mic work, that it would be a complete and utter waste for them to just drop it cold turkey and going back to the way that you know, going back to the status, the, the status quo. Excuse me, part of my botching. It's going back to the way that things used to be before the promo took place. You know, capitalize it off it, dude. Capitalize off this thing. People are talking about it, so you know, go with the flow, acknowledge it, and make the most of it. Miz is hotter right now. He's being more. He's being talked about more now than he has ever been, and at least the last five years. So run with it, dude. You know, make the most of it. So I really hope it's not an abandoned storyline. And then, then again, it would not surprise me in the slightest. How I would resolve the feud, I mean, I think a great idea, I think someone else brought this up, not me, but I read it elsewhere, that uh, maybe Daniel Bryan tries to, you know, have run, have Miz run the gauntlet every week in an attempt to have him, you know, lose the Intercontinental Championship. Who knows? I feel like that could be a really fun storyline. So hopefully they do do something with it and it's not just completely ignored. Um, if Talking Smack is, you know, in the, in the same canon, in the same universe as SmackDown, then it would make sense to kind of run with that and have Miz be the number one enemy of SmackDown GM Daniel Bryan. Um, his next question, do you think there will be any surprises in the SmackDown Tag Team and Women's Championship matches at Backlash? Maybe the tag team one, if they have Slater and Rhino win, that'd be pretty cool. The women's match, I feel like, is pretty straightforward. I would either have Nikki Bella win or I, not. I mean, I would. I mean, I could see Nikki Bella winning, is what I'm saying. I wouldn't have her win. I could see her winning though. I would just give the belt to Becky Lynch. I feel like that's the uh, most logical choice. I guess the surprising finish would be having Naomi win, which wouldn't be the worst thing. But I feel like that'd be more surprising than having you know either Becky or Nikki win. Who have you know read rumors about that she might be winning the belt? I really hope not. Nothing screams new era like putting the women's championship on Nikki Bella again. 
Whatever. Uh, Cody C. Also from Facebook. Who would you like to see face The Miz at Backlash? Um, originally, I said Apollo Crews just because I feel like they have unfinished business. I know Miz beat him clean at SummerSlam 1, 2, 3. But I feel like the match was good, and they could build to an Apollo Crews title and a Backlash or beyond that. So, for right now, I, I'll say Crews. But if it's not Crews, who else could it be? Kalisto? The guy's barely on TV as it is, you know? I feel like Crews despite how cold he feels right now, could be a bigger threat to that IC title than Kalisto. So I'll say Cruz uh, for Miz's opponent at Backlash. Moving on now to the Twitter questions. At Reborn again, his first question was, have you seen any of the Clash of Champions events on the network? If so, what are your favorite matches? I have not. I'm positive I've seen at least one of Clash of Champions match just because I have the rise and fall of WCW DVD. A great get, by the way. You can watch the documentary on the network, but the actual DVD with the matches is really enlightening for a fan like me that was not around for WCW in their prime, or just around for WCW at all. But um, I'm sure I've seen a Clash of Champions match before. I have never seen a Clash of Champions pay-per-view in its entirety. I might watch one or two before the upcoming installment, WWE's version of it, um, in a couple weeks or next month, rather. Um, but I will review it on WrestleRant at some point, not anytime soon. I already have the WrestleRant schedule set out up until like fucking like WrestleMania 33, so it's gonna be a while. But once I'm done reviewing all the WWE pay-per-views on the network, I'll be reviewing all the WCW pay-per-views, maybe concurrently with the ECW shows. We'll see how it turns out. But as soon as I start reviewing the WCW pay-per-views, hopefully the Clash of Champions shows will be the first ones I review. Um, if you guys want to see that, just let me know. Second question of his, even though he's gone for up to six months, what are the chances Finn Balor returns in the Royal Rumble? I think it's pretty likely. I'm not saying he will return in the Rumble, but that would be the perfect time for it to win the Rumble. He's a fresh face, you know, in an attempt to get back the championship he never lost and, you know, go for the gold at WrestleMania 33 in Orlando, the same place where he kind of helped build the NXT brand over the past two and a half years. I feel like it makes perfect sense. So it, it's likely, I'm not going to say highly likely, because as you said, it could be anywhere from six you know, four to six months, and that is within the time frame that Balor could be back. That is within the time frame of the Rumble. But you know what? He could be out for a year. I hate to say it, but if Tommy was originally scheduled to be out for six to eight months, but he didn't come back until fucking, you know, a year and a half later, until 18 months later. So hopefully that's not the case with him, with Finn Balor, but you never really know. And his third question here, given the choice, who would you rather see face Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 33, Samoa Joe or Big Cat? Samoa, Samoa Joe all the way, dude. Not even not even a debate. Um, Big Cass, I like Big Cass, but he should not be getting a singles push at any time in the near future, if ever. The guy's good, but I feel like him and Enzo benefit from being with each other. They're an amazing tag team as singles guys. I would care more about Enzo at this point than Big Cass. He is just not quite there. And maybe it will happen, but Samoa Joe and Brock Lesnar is a personal dream match of mine. I feel like it'd be kick-ass. Maybe Brock Lesnar would beat Joe's ass for 20 minutes. Who knows? Um, but I feel like I'd be much more excited for that match happening than you know Lesnar versus Big Cass at this point. At Jeremy8911, his question was, If Nakamura gets called up before WrestleMania, who would you like to see him face at WrestleMania? Um, a couple different options. I talked about Brock Lesnar before. That'd be pretty cool. AJ Styles is my pick. Cena would be pretty cool. I feel like it's too soon for that. Um, but Styles Nakamura, they had an amazing match at Wrestle Kingdom 10, I think it was, earlier this year. I don't watch much Japanese wrestling, but, you know, AJ sent me, or AJ, uh, I'm talking about AJ, but RJ sent me the link to that match, um, right after AJ debuted in WWE. It's a great goddamn match, so check it out when you can. Um, but I would love to see that on a grand stage. I think it'd be, it would definitely be the first ever match to be held at Wrestle Kingdom, and WrestleMania, um, ever. Not in the same calendar year, but just ever. And that'd be fucking sick. So, you know, obviously Wrestle Kingdom is New Japan's version of WrestleMania. So, that'd be sick. Um, I would love to see Styles and Nakamura at WrestleMania 33 just because I might be there to see it. That'd be fucking amazing. Um, but if it's not Nakamura Styles or Nakamura Lesnar, maybe Nakamura... Basically, anything, anyone versus Nakamura on the main roster would be a dream match at this point. Even Slater. Probably not, but you know what I mean. Uh, Nakamura... Joe, Nakamura Balor again, Nakamura Cesaro, Nakamura Owens, I feel like would be awesome. They had one of my favorite Ring of Honor matches ever. I think at War of the Worlds, I think it was, or Global Wars maybe, I forgot what pay-per-view exactly. Back in May of 2014, one of the first ever Ring of Honor matches I watched, and I was blown away, I thought it was great. At the average grunt, 
Do you think Backlash has the potential to top Vengeance 03? I don't think so. I know you have an attachment to that pay-per-view. It's such a good show, and I can't blame you. Uh, Backlash should be a good show. Who knows? It could very well top it. We have AJ and Ambrose. We have the six-pack challenge for the vacant, you know, for the first ever SmackDown Women's title. We have the finals and the SmackDown Tag Team title tournament. So we could have a lot of good matches on that show, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, But, yeah, I mean, we could even have Corbin and Kalisto. We could have Orton and Wyatt. There's a lot of good matches that could happen at, at Backlash. I don't know if it's going to top Vengeance 03, but it could come close. Who knows? The SmackDown pay-per-views are really fucking good, so we'll see. His second question, and I apologize to the average Grunt for this one. I know he sent it in a week or two ago, and I know he liked it. I put it in my likes, but he asked it so early that I only went through the questions that were from, like, Sunday and beyond. And I know he asked it on, like, the Thursday of that week, so I apologize, but... Better late than never, I guess. His question was, how would you book a Team Raw versus Team SmackDown match at Survivor Series? Um, I guess if you're asking me who would, I, who would I put on each team, I mean, this isn't really realistic just because you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You can't put all your top stars in one match. But if you're really going to do the best of each brand, I know Brock Lesnar probably wouldn't be around for it, but um, Lesnar on Team Raw. Let's see, he is. Brock Lesnar on Team Raw with Roman, with Rollins, with Balor is hurt, so I won't include Balor. Uh, Reigns, Rollins, Lesnar, Owens, and who else? Let's go with uh, Rusev, I guess. Or eh, Rusev versus Zara. I feel like Rusev's a bigger priority right now. So I'll go Rusev, Reigns, Rollins, Lesnar, and um, I think that's it, right? Or oh, Owens, too, I said. And then for SmackDown, I would include John Cena. AJ Styles, obviously, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, and Bray Wyatt. I feel like SmackDown just owns that match, but uh, that'd be a great match nevertheless. At Sean Markistic, should WWE dedicate an hour of Raw to the Cruiserweight division? I don't expect them to. Um, I think a half an hour would be nice. You know, I think 15 minutes is, is bare minimum, obviously, but I don't think they're going to dedicate an hour. I think it would work out for the best. they do a whole hour of Cruiserweight Classic matches on the network, but that's with commercials and previews and bracketology, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't think that's all that realistic. But it would be cool. It would technically make, if you really think about it, if they dedicated the first hour of Raw to the, only the Cruiserweights, that would make Raw two hours again, you know, almost by default. It's a win-win. We get the Cruiserweights. We get two-hour Raws. You know, I don't think that's happening, but uh, I wouldn't be opposed to it at all. His next question, will WWE ever do a second match between Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar? Well, dude, we got our answer today. Um, it was just confirmed a few hours ago that they are doing a second match. Paul Heyman said it himself on his Twitter at a Raw house show the day before the Clash of Champions pay-per-view. So why the hell would you not wait until the pay-per-view the next day? I guess they want to maybe boost live event sales. The tickets must be that week that they're bringing in Lesnar and doing a SummerSlam rematch. And from what I'm hearing, it's not going to be on the network. And why would it be? They have a pay-per-view the next day. It makes no sense. I mean, I guess not that it makes no sense, but I think the chances of it being broadcast on the network are slim to none. So I hope people in the Chicago, I believe it's where it is, people at that Chicago live event get their phones ready and get ready to record it because that's the only way that people like you and I will be able to see it. Uh, is Seth Rollins dangerous, he asks. Um, I don't think so. The Cena thing was an accident. Sting was an accident. It was both Sting and Rollins' fault. The Balor fuck-up was both Balor's fault, putting out his arm. Rollins was, he judged it, and he, you know, he judged too early, and he, he would have botched it anyway, whether, you know, Balor put his arm out or not, so. But if the guy had a reputation for being reckless, he would not be a top guy right now. He'd be at the bottom of the card. He would have been fired if he was known to have been hurting people. I know Saul Monster, you know, went on a huge rant about this on his podcast, and I could not agree more just this past week, so kind of steal from him. Mr. Kennedy is a prime example. Mr. Kennedy, and it's not like, oh, Seth Rollins is, you know, in bed with Triple H. He's, you know, he's a, he's a favorite of, of the company, so of course they wouldn't punish him. Ken Kennedy was a favorite of the company. Trust me. Why else do you think? The guy was never an amazing wrestler. But why else do you think they would have him beat Undertaker, Batista, Booker T, Rey Mysterio, you know what I mean? He stacked up victory after victory over on SmackDown in his rookie year. Chris Benoit, another guy he beat in his first year on SmackDown. But because he was known as a very unsafe worker with the likes of Taker and Cena and Batista and others, and Orton especially, he was the one that got him fired. He was the one that uh, that that, that, uh, that broke the camel's back in terms of, in terms of getting Kennedy fired. <laughs> um, he did not last very long in that company. And Kennedy was you know, uh, a pet project of Vince McMahon, but because he was very unsafe in the ring, they canned him. 
So if Rollins was unsafe, he would not have lasted this long, and he would not be a top guy right now. The guy's been doing that buckle power bomb, that you know the the buckle power bomb, whatever you want to call it, turnbuckle power bomb, for so long now, for almost four years, and even on the indie scene that he's hurt very few people. It doesn't look great. Maybe he could save it for special occasions. I mean, it, it looks great, but I mean in terms of injuring the other person. Um, but I wouldn't call him dangerous. A lot like Samoa Joe is not dangerous for injuring Tyson Kidd. Shit happens, dude. I'm sorry, Bret Hart, but shit happens. I mean, people get hurt. That's wrestling. Next question from Matt Swagzio. Uh, should Brock Lesnar do a storyline in which when the next time he loses, he can never he can never wrestle in WWE again, i.e. Ric Flair in 08? I think it worked for Ric Flair because people really wanted to see his career live on. Brock Lesnar, I mean, I guess same thing, but he's more of a heel, so it really wouldn't make as much sense. And I said before that the next match that he loses, not that he has no worth, but I feel like he doesn't have much else to do the next time he loses. After that, what else is there to do? He's already broken the streak. He's already reigned as world champion. So what else is there to do, you know? So that being said, um, I, I guess I could see it kind of working, but Brock Lesnar is no Ric Flair, so I don't really want to see that storyline rehashed for the Beast. His next question, if you could create your own pay-per-view title, what would it be? Good question. Um, I did my own fantasy wrestling organization many years ago with my brother, and a lot of the pay-per-view names I had were total shit. Even some of them I stole from WWE, like Night of Champions. So I guess if they steal this one, then we're even. But I always thought either Hero's Final Stand, I know that sounds like a video game, but either Hero's Final Stand would be a good title or No Vacancy. Like No Vacancy on the card. That might have been used by already by another wrestling promotion. I'm not exactly sure. But I always thought No Vacancy would be a great pay-per-view title. So if they steal that and use that for themselves, you know where it came from first. And I doubt they would give me credit, but I did steal Night of Champions from them for my own wrestling organization many years ago. So I guess that makes us even in their book. In my book, anyway. Or both of our books. Next question. Um, at John Wealth 23 Other than Ty Dillinger, is there any other NXT superstars being wasted right now? I don't know if he's being wasted... Um, but Andrade Almas, and we've talked about it here on the show before, I feel like he could be booked a lot better. Just in terms of his character, maybe you give him his mask back. I don't know what needs to change with the dude. Maybe just dropping the stupid suspenders in the hat. I don't know what needs to change, but it's just not clicking right now. So I feel like he could be doing a lot better than he is currently. Um, also, who is the other guy? Murphy, too. I know Murphy is not like a standout single star or anything. He should be, um, but I think he's pretty good. Not that he's the next NXT champion or anything, but now that he's finally on his own, hopefully he can finally develop his own personality. I feel like he has a lot more potential to be on his own as a as a breakout single star than uh, Wesley Blake, who just bores me to tears. Uh, next question of his, if women like Sasha or Charlotte came to WWE five years ago, would women's wrestling be better or still mediocre? That's a great question, and I'm going to go with the latter. I feel like women's wrestling would still be a joke. It's not like we didn't have great workers five years ago. We had Melina, we had Gail Kim, we had Eve, Beth Phoenix, AJ Lee, all these really good workers, but they weren't doing anything with them. And I feel like NXT was a huge, huge factor. That's a huge understatement. NXT was a major factor in getting women's wrestling back to the forefront of this company. Had it not been for the matches between Paige and Emma, Charlotte and Natalia, you know, Charlotte and Sasha, Charlotte and Bailey, and so on and so forth. Sasha and Bailey from Brooklyn last year. Women's wrestling, we would have not have gotten the return of the women's championship. We would have not had the feuds between Charlotte and Sasha that we do now. We would not have had that amazing match between Charlotte and Sasha. It wasn't the workers. We had really good workers five years ago. Ten years ago, maybe not more so, but five years ago in 2011, and that's what you're saying, we still had pretty good workers. They just weren't using them right. You know, we could have had great feuds and great matches with Eve and AJ or AJ and Beth, but they were more focused on just really giving them two minute matches and not really giving a shit. So even if Sasha and Charlotte were around five years ago and just came straight up to the main roster, women's wrestling, I hate to say it, would not have changed. I feel like it was really just a matter of the times um, with them coming up at the exact right time in the last couple of years. And that if they came up five years ago, they would be probably no different than the Kelly Kellys or the, you know, the Eves of the world, where they would have gotten probably a, a title reign or two. But the perception of women's racing, the, the perception of women's wrestling, would not have changed a single bit. His next question: On a scale of one to ten, what would you give the Dudley Boys' latest run in WWE? I'm probably being generous, but I would give it a six. 
Um, I love the Dudley Boys. They were probably, I think, at every show that I went to in the last year. They were at Raw both times. They were at SmackDown, TLC, Extreme Rules, SummerSlam. So, um, yeah, they've been at pretty much every WWE show that I've been to at the last in the last year. Uh, SummerSlam too. Both or just the first Summer or the second SummerSlam. They weren't back by last year's SummerSlam. They came back the day after. But uh, they came back to put people over. That's what I always envisioned it, envisioned it as. I would have loved to have seen Bobby Ray on his own as a single star. I would have loved to have seen a Team 3D or a Dudley Boys tag team title reign in WWE one last time and maybe one day. But I think they came back. My 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 mindset was always that they came back to put other people over. And that's exactly what they did. They put over the New Day. They put over the Usos. They put over the Lucha Dragons. They put over all these other tandems. The Usos. They put over Enzo and Cass. A million times over, they put him over like a million bucks. So can you really complain? You know. So I feel like they did exactly what they set out to do. Um, do I wish they would have done more with them? Absolutely. But you can't complain about them coming back and put over younger guys who are the future. So um, I feel like they could have done more with them, but they did serve their purpose. So that's why I give them a six. Next couple of questions from at E13A. Um, his first question was: Was Daniel Bryan in the wrong on talking smack, admitting that he didn't want that he doesn't want to utilize Miz, calling his style soft? Yeah, I mean, I you know went more in depth about this on Randy Cruz's Cruise Control podcast last Thursday. If you want to check it out, I'm not going to go into huge rant mode here, but yeah, I got to side with Miz, just not because I'm a Miz fan, but I know Miz hasn't had if any really great matches in his ten years in WWE. But the guy's never been hurt. He's still around. He's still doing the media rounds, which is what is most important to him. And he's right. That shit is absolutely important. Company awareness. If he was hurt, he wouldn't be able to do all the Be A Star rallies or the celebrity signings or the red carpet events or the movies, which aren't huge anyway. But you know what I mean? It's still a big deal to them, to Miz and WWE and whoever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, not every wrestler needs to do flippity doo dies. It needs to be super exciting in the ring. Miz makes the most of what he has. He doesn't need to do, you know, 450 splashes. He's an all right wrestler. He's improved as a wrestler, but it's not his wrestling skills that make him an overact. It's his entertaining antics, like telling the crowd to shut up and, you know, running away from his opponent. Like that stuff is entertaining to me. So he doesn't need to be, he, he's a great performer just because of what he can do in the ring without really wrestling, if that makes sense. Uh, his next question what would be more interesting, Bret Hart versus Samoa Joe or Bret Hart versus Seth Rollins? So obviously the two people that Bret Hart has not been hesitant in calling out in recent weeks. Um, but a better match would obviously be Hart and Rollins. But I think more interesting would be Bret Hart and Samoa Joe. Just to see Joe, uh, a, a total kayfabe Joe, taking offense to Bret Hart's comments, ripping the hitman apart. So I feel like that would be more interesting. So I'd have to go with Joe versus uh, Bret Hart. At the Wrestle Guy, who do you think is an early favorite to win the Royal Rumble? Like I said earlier, probably Finn Balor. Uh, maybe Rollins or, you know, Ambrose would be cool. Or AJ Styles on the one-year anniversary. Uh, unless he wins the belt, you know, in the next couple months, if not next month. Uh, AJ winning the Rumble at the one-year anniversary of his WWE debut would be amazing. But I'll put my money on Balor for right now. His second question, should AJ Styles beat Ambrose, speaking of which, should AJ Styles beat Ambrose at Backlash after his win over John Cena, or should his big moment be saved for a bigger stage? You know, as much as they want to say, give him the belt at a Big Four pay-per-view, Survivor Series, let's face it, is not really a Big Four pay-per-view anymore. The 2014 show, as great as that Team Authority versus Team Cena match was, that whole show was not great. The last really good Survivor Series show, in my opinion, and some other people might disagree, was the 2011 installment five years ago. Since then, Survivor Series has not at all felt like a Big Four pay-per-view. So, if you gave him the belt there, what would it really matter? I know it's in Toronto, it'd be a great reaction, but it'd still probably be a good reaction too if you wanted a backlash. And AJ is so hot right now, you gotta strike while the iron is hot. He is fresh off a clean victory over fucking John Cena at SummerSlam. Give him the belt yesterday, you know, let alone a backlash. So, yes, and Ambrose is not really lighting the world on fire as champion, if you haven't noticed. So, yeah, I would give the belt to AJ as soon as Backlash, just because he is the really the hottest thing going in WWE right now. And his third question, I didn't put it in the document for whatever reason, but I'm pretty sure his question was, keep or erase, my SummerSlam experience weekend, my SummerSlam weekend experience last year in Brooklyn, or my SummerSlam weekend experience in Brooklyn this year? Great question, and probably my favorite question of today's installment. Whew, I'd probably keep this year's experience and erase last year's. Both were amazing, but this year's 
barely ekes out a victory just because if you consider the three days in Brooklyn and everything I got to witness, I got to see Bailey's main roster debut, the Dudley Boys final farewell, uh, the crowning of a new Universal Champion, and the relinquishing of the that of said Universal Champion, the debut of that title, which is I, I, think, I don't think a good thing, but the match was good between Balor and Rollins. I got to see AJ beating John Cena clean. I got to see Nakamura winning the NXT Championship, a Tommy's first ever GTS, Bobby Roode's first ever NXT match, and the glorious entrance of his. So I gotta, I gotta keep this year in a race. Last year, I would have been kicking myself last year if I was not in attendance for Bailey's big, you know, title win in Brooklyn. But I also would have been kicking myself if I was not in attendance for her big main roster debut on Raw. So that being said, I gotta keep this year in a race. Last year, it's a tough one, but uh, like I said, great question. At the one, two, three egg, what was going on with Titus O'Neil's promo on Raw last week? Just an awful promo. You knew it was all downhill from the moment that he started botching like the first five words of his promo. It was bad. And John was gone, thankfully, for most of the segment, so he didn't see it. He probably heard it in the hallways and the subsequent booing from the crowd. It was just a train wreck of a segment. And I like feuds like that between O'Neill and Young getting mic time on Raw. That's good. But in you know, storyline progression and whatnot. But O'Neill is just not a great talker. Or at least these scripted promos will be the death of this fucking generation of guys. It's awful. It is awful. Not a good promo at all. At Scarlet One, we'll finish off with her final two questions here. First one being, if Roman Reigns won the title tonight, how would that make you feel? Are you prepared for how it would make you feel? Um, I would just be more like, eh, again, I wouldn't be like one of those people like, fuck you, WWE, that was awful. I wouldn't be full of rage like Alex Riley would say. I would just be like, eh. Okay, you know, I'd just be more like, oh, whatever. Um, and I am prepared for that, because like I said, I do have Reigns winning tonight. Just because I feel like, you know, I feel like Reigns is going to be the biggest beneficiary of Balor getting hurt, because now he can finally reclaim that top spot on Raw as the number one babyface for the flagship show. Um, so I am prepared for that. I don't want to see it happen, but I am fearful it will happen. And the final question of today's video, which I think is a great final question to end off with, with September quickly approaching, who do you or what do you expect the final four months of 2016 to turn out, or how do you expect them to turn out? I guess um, I can't really say, just because the first eight months of this year have been so incredibly unpredictable and awesome. Still my favorite year in wrestling. I still say that. Still my favorite year in wrestling already, beating out 2015. If you told me at this point a year ago, let alone on December 31st, 2015 that AJ Styles would be in WWE, Shinsuke Nakamura would be in WWE, that we would have the brand split back, that we would have the Cruiserweight division back, that we would have the Women's Championship back, and all these other, that we would have Backlash back, No Mercy back. I would have called you crazy, I would have inducted you, I would have entered you right into the Ambrose Asylum, maybe with the Dirty Deeds, just because all of those were such bold predictions that no one could have ever predicted. And I'm, I'm just super glad 2016 has turned out the way it has. It hasn't been without its, you know, disappointing moments like Benjamin getting injured, Balor getting injured, and stuff like that. Um, but by and large, it's been a really, really good year for wrestling. So um, one can only imagine what the rest of this year will hold for 2016 in WWE. I know the fall is traditionally like the worst time of the year for this company. Raw almost always sucks in September, October, and November. Hopefully it's not the case this year. I really, really hope not, but I'm preparing for the worst because I can't really remember the last fall season that was good. Last year it was awful. 2014 sucked. 2013 sucked. 2012 was bad too. 2011 was awful. 2010 and 2009 and beyond that I can't really remember, but I'm pretty sure they were boring. But um, So yeah, that being said, the last couple of fall seasons in WWE have not been good traditionally. Hopefully we can break that sad streak this year. I'm not counting on it, um, especially with Balor being hurt, but one can only hope that will be the case. So with all that being said, guys, as always, thank you for your amazing questions being sent in. I really like this week's batch of questions from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You guys sent in a lot of good questions. Um, be sure to do, continue to send them in through Twitter at WrestleRant with the hashtag, hashtag AskGSM. On Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Graham.Jason.Matthews. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Sunday nights or on the wall itself, or be sure to leave a comment on this very video down below in the comment section. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. 
So that does it, guys. That is the final hashtag Ask JSM of the summer. Uh, next week is Labor Day. I will, I will be doing it. I mean, obviously, you can't see me. I'm doing audio only here today. And that's probably going to continue to be the case coming forward. I feel like using my HD camera is cool. But I'll probably relegate that only to the... Uh, to the uh, Friday random video blog just because it's a lot easier to edit and it's shorter. These videos are closer to an hour, so it's a lot longer to upload and all that kind of shit. But anyway, anyway, continue to send in those questions. Continue your amazing support. It really does mean a lot to me. You guys are amazing. And continue to have a great week and enjoy Raw tonight if you're watching this or listening to this before Raw, rather. So anyway, guys, I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch you fine folks down the road.